Hello, everyone, and welcome to our ongoing conversations about how people are living their digital lives and creating immersive experiences. We're thrilled today to have Jeff Ovadia, Director of Sales and Marketing for Vicon Motion Capture Solutions, and John Root, our Virtual Production Supervisor at the Technicolor Experience Center. So we should have very interesting perspectives from both sides of the industry. Uh, with that, let's dive into it. John, I'm really curious to hear about the history of motion capture. So what role does motion capture play in creating a traditional film and then these new immersive experiences that are emerging? Sure, yeah. I mean, motion capture has been around for, I think, more than 30 years, depending on what you want to consider motion capture. You know, I think uh, you can go back further and look at what, you know, Edward Moybridge was doing with his, uh, you know, triggered cameras and the old black and white motion studies of humans. Um, but it was, I believe, uh, the young Sherlock Holmes, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where that stained glass uh, character jumps off the window and uh, attacks the young Sherlock Holmes, I think, was often cited as the first use of motion capture in in feature films. And, you know, of course, what had to happen to make that effect work was a lot different than uh, what it looks like on today's big Hollywood virtual production sound stages where, you know, uh, Christmas Carol avatars of the world are being made. Um, you know, back when I got into it some 25 years ago, we were just using it to uh, just to animate characters for video games. Um, and it was, a, it was a slow, very labor-intensive process. It took, you know, a very long time from a lot of people to turn around even the simplest animations. Um, you know, and, and nowadays, you know, if you look at like the, the latest iteration of the Vicon Shogun stuff, I mean, it kind of rolls off the stage. And so that's good because it allows us to tell a lot more kinds of stories uh, faster and better and cheaper. But it's also started to enable this whole uh, explosion of virtual reality, augmented reality. You know, all these immersive uh, technologies are very synonymous with motion capture. So if you think about like, you know, Maybe you've got an Oculus Rift at home or something. That little camera is tracking these points on the headset. You know, it's a little tiny motion capture system. So, you know, what's really been amazing to me is to see that, like, you know, the uh, the Valve Lighthouse, the Oculus Rift Constellation, and all these other things are these little tiny mocap systems that are going into every home in the U.S. You know, the Microsoft Kinect. You know, we're just finding all these really neat, uh, real-time you know, uh, immersive uses for motion capture. So it's been uh, it's been a real journey to see how we got here. So, Jeff, now that, you know, these motion capture systems are being deployed uh, at a small scale even and miniaturized in consumer electronics, how is Vicon staying at the very cutting edge of this technology and what it enables? Right. Well, motion capture, kind of as John already alluded to, uh, runs the entire gamut to – uh, tiny micro devices in our everyday lives to big motion capture stages used for feature films and uh, large-scale location-based VR. Uh, John Underkoffler from MIT and I believe of Oblong Industries now said in a TED Talk in 2011 uh, that these kinds of motion capture systems will be in our living rooms in five years, and most people were kind of laughing at him because he was – displaying kind of a gestural-based motion tracking that was used by his design in, um, oh, why am I forgetting the uh, the movie now? Minority Report. Minority um, Report, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I, I kind of laughed, 2011, 2016, there's no way. But truly, yeah, you look at the Oculus Rift, you look at all of the uh, small built-in motion capture systems, and now the standalone Oculus Rift that's coming out, the, these things are ready to go and packaged for people to uh, – access and consume on their phones and everything else. But Vicon really tries to push the edge further along the highest end of the gamut um, by really allowing people to get um, true human motion integrated into everything that they do uh, as fast as possible, as biomechanically accurate as possible, and as unbreakable as possible. So that if you wanted to put humans live into a VR environment or live into an immersive uh, environment, that's not a problem at all. When John was describing some of the early days of mocap, yeah, you collected data and then worked on it for five years before it actually hit the film. Now you can get that data live or uh, to, to the quality that you'd want at the end of the day. But we also want to make sure that all of the uh, cutting-edge 
um, features that we release in any of our products are also being utilized in the background of all of the products that people do use on an everyday basis. So uh, clients such as yeah, Apple and Disney and other big names that create content for everyday consumers, they have Vicon systems that they use in the background to validate all of their projects. That's a really interesting application. Um, can you expand on that a little bit in terms of how other markets are potentially adopting uh, these motion capture systems outside of traditional film? Sure. Well, I mean, motion capture is essentially tracking motion in some capacity. And what we aim to do is to use um, fiducial, mostly fiducial-based tracking with our camera systems so that we can give you uh, six degree of freedom information, right, X, Y, and Z, as well as all the rotations uh, over time in the most accurate and most consumable and most easily accessible way possible. So effectively, it's a tracking system for anything. Um, if Disney Imagineering wanted to make sure that their new ride at the Disneyland Park is going to be in the exact place that the control systems that they, that they design expect it to be, they could use a Vicon system to test that, and they'll make sure that they get the exact results with, uh, you know, even better than submillimeter accuracy. So it's, it's being used simply as a tracking system. In other cases, and this is really Vicon's bread and butter, it's being used for biomechanical applications where you analyze how people move, gait analysis, uh, for rehabilitation, uh, sports performance, all of these different things by knowing exactly how the human body moves and how that's been perfected over the years since the days of MyBridge all the way to uh, the first Oxford metric systems in 1984, um, we've just gotten better at better understanding how humans move. And so as uh, there's almost two different spectrums, you look at how motion capture has progressed. Well, you can get data faster, easier, computer processing is better. But on the other side, biomechanics has uh, absolutely exploded over the last years, especially with a lot of funding by sports and uh, different industries that want to know more about humans move. So when you combine those two together, you've got uh, the scientists at Vicon that do both at the same time, taking in uh, research from all these different markets and then putting into a package that allows you to do everything from the best possible tracking while incorporating uh, the epitome of current biomechanical analysis. Uh, Jeff, you make it almost sound like the uh, feature films in the entertainment industry. It's like, you know, I feel kind of humbled by the notion that, uh, you know, doctors and scientists are using this to, like, you know, cure diseases and, like, fix problems, trying to capture a space marine blowing up a cyber demon or something over here. <laughs> <laughs> the the wide-ranging applications are really incredible uh, for the technology. And, you know, I do want to come back to that. But bringing it back to, you know, Technicolor's bread and butter, which is um, – you know, the the feature film. John, how does understanding the, you know, the human gait and all of this rich information that we're gathering with these mocap systems change traditional film production? And, you know, what does it enable that ultimately alters the way stories are told? Well, I guess we're talking about crossing the uncanny valley there, right? So, you know, once you can virtualize the production, once you can take actors and uh, record a performance and then play it back from any angle and, uh, you know, under any circumstances, it really unlocks this whole treasure trove of possibilities. Remember in the early days, people used to always ask me, like, you know, gosh, if you're just trying to make it look real, why didn't you just shoot it for real? And, you know, there's a lot of answers to that question. One of my favorites is, is the camera. So, you know, a big part, a big part of uh, virtual uh, production is the virtual cinematography. So, Maybe you have two actors record a dialogue exchange and you get it exactly how you like it. Like they all delivered their lines perfectly and everything went, you know, awesomely. In a live action set, you'd have to shoot that same bit of dialogue maybe 10 times over the first guy's shoulder, over the other guy's shoulder, maybe a wide, a top down. You know, you need all these different camera angles that go into editorial that, you know, become the movie. In a virtual production, you might just capture it once. And then you could uh, lay down as many cameras, capture as much coverage as they say as you want. And then you get it all into your editor's bin, and your editor starts, you know, playing with different cuts. And they might say, uh, 
you know, gosh, if I only had this two shot or if we only had a close up on him at this point, and it's really easy to just load that performance back up and grab some more camera angles of it. So, you know, from that point of view, it's, it's uh, amazingly flexible. But then that's just sort of level one, right? Level two is uh, the performance might have even been better if, you know, uh, she was looking at it or, you know, maybe if we took that line out and we inserted this line from this other take entirely uh, on onto that little piece of animation. So the editability and the flexibility of virtualizing the production is, is huge. And that, I think, is what is drawing a lot of directors and cinematographers to it. It's about sort of really being able to perfect that stuff. But also, uh, there's an exploration phase that happens where, you know, sometimes you, you don't know exactly how a scene is supposed to play out. And virtual production allows you to, you know, play with many different possibilities. So it becomes this, like, uh, extreme previs in a way that, uh, you know, it's a sandbox for directors to, you know, try all kinds of different things and swap out different components. And, you know, you might have an entire, uh, say, jungle forest and you want to, you know, pull in some new rocks and get rid of those trees. And, you know what, let's make it sunset. Let's make it sunrise. You know, it's, uh, it, it's a pretty amazing and powerful toolkit. And once you've started making movies this way, it becomes real hard to imagine yourself, you know, driving out to the desert and setting up, you know, $10 million worth of gear when, uh, you know, in for, for that one hour of day where you have just the right lighting, um, you know, virtualizing the whole thing is, is really the future. So digging a bit deeper into that, how do you see it then enabling volumetric storytelling and, you know, keeping that flexibility in a way that's passed all the way down the pipeline to the end user so that, you know, that person can experience the story uh, as they want to experience it at different times. Sure. So right now we're capturing uh, the motions of people and we're able to, you know, recreate those in, uh, you know, in real time in like, you know, Unity or Unreal. Uh, and we're able to even retarget those motions. So we might take, you know, uh, my motions and then put them on to, uh, you know, some kind of fantastic creature or something like that. So that's a cool ability um, but you mentioned something that's sort of the, the hot state-of-the-art thing right now, which is volumetric capture. And that's um, – it is a form of motion capture, but it's sort of a on steroids version where you might take an actor not in a, uh, you know, black spandex suit with, with white markers all over them, but actually in a costume and makeup and put them out into this box and record their performance volumetrically. So you're getting all the uh, motions of the cloth and the deformations of the skin, and it's all exactly how it happened. And then you can import that into, you know, the rendering engine of your choice. That's, uh, you know, gaining more and more favor. But the real bleeding edge, as it were, is how do you then take that and give yourself that, uh, previously I mentioned the editability, where I might like this performance better if it had, uh, you know, her head was looking a little bit more this way, or if she took an extra step, or what an animator might bring to it at the direction of, you know, the editor or the DP or the, or the director himself. And so, you know, that's uh, sort of where the, the, the state of the art is being created right now. So, Jeff, I'd love to throw it back to you then and, and understand, you know, we, it's evolved an immense amount since its inception, but what are the hard problems that are left to solve uh, for motion capture? What are you guys pushing on every day, and, and where do you see it going in the next five years? That's really great, and a perfect segue from the last thing that John was just mentioning about volumetric capture. Yeah, okay, you've got the real-world performance in there, but the flexibility isn't there, and really that's, that's one of the things that we're going to start pushing pretty extremely so that you can have somebody in costume and have a real-world performance but able to extract the digital information so that you do have the flexibility. Um, John mentioned, I really like that, extreme previs. That's where we are now because of the power of all of the game engines uh, and and the rendering engines out there now. You could do anything with effectively infinite real-world cameras using a virtual camera. So being able to extract information without having to rely entirely on line of sight, and I say entirely because line of sight, meaning the cameras actually look at the markers and use the information from the markers that they see, um, 
is incredibly accurate, but sometimes you really just can't do that. You've got incredible uh, performance actors like Andy Serkis and others out there where they understand how to move with all of this apparatus on them, but you want to do a love scene between two digital characters, for example. You've got face cameras and all these things going on. It's not, it's not as good as a real powerful emotional scene between two humans. So we're gonna re- you're going to start seeing a lot of things uh, from Vicon that really start to push the edge of what you can do uh, with different tools to be able to capture motion and really deliver the best possible performance metrics uh, as fast and as biomechanically accurate as possible. That will always be the backbone of what makes us uh, the largest and best motion capture uh, provider out there is that you know that you're going to be getting something that's accurate without having to sacrifice um, Without, you're going to get something that's on the cutting edge without having to sacrifice accuracy. You brought up Andy Serkis, which you know makes me think of the the hybrid approach of Planet of the Apes and you know some of these other films that are uh, blending motion capture in real world environments. John, you know, would you be able to touch on some of the additional challenges introduced by these types of shoots and and how you see? the two, you know, hybridizing or blending even further uh, in the near future? Yeah, I think the hot thing right now on virtual production stages is virtual reality. So you've got directors that are, you know, previewing their sets and watching their performances uh, from within VR. And, you know, you think about the large-scale VR stuff, like, you know, maybe I want a headset to be able to move anywhere in a, you know, 60-foot by 30-foot stage. Uh, that's no easy task. And, you know, VR has a lot of really specific things, you know, so for the last 30 years, we've been trying to make, you know, more accurate motion and that's uh, super important. But now all of a sudden we need this like, you know, super low latency, you know, before I think we're starting to really question like what real time even means, you know, there's no such thing as real time. Nothing happens instantly. So it's, it's at this level that like, you know, uh, is perceptually real time and, and, and how fast is that? Right. And so, you know, with, uh, with VR, it has to happen within milliseconds. And so having a motion capture system that can deliver this information, these six degrees of freedom transforms that Jeff referred to, uh, you know, at a, at a speed that is perceived as instant is, uh, you know, really hard and, important to virtual production that is using virtual reality and, you know, also important to when you're just using like virtual camera or any kinds of other interesting devices out there. But, uh, you know, when you think about the unique problem of virtual reality and then augmented reality, uh, you know, this is, this is sort of where the advancements are happening right now. I, I am curious to hear, though, you know, a, a lot of these, there's, there's kind of two sides um, to these mocap film productions, you know, one that's that's really on a stage and, and completely virtualized, and one where, you know, the mocap system is, is taken off the stage and deployed in the real world. Um, can, you know, Jeff, can you speak to the the use cases you're seeing there for um, films and, and how that really enables, you know, a new hybrid form of storytelling? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you take something that is extremely uh, extremely accurate and highly capable from a controlled environment where you can really control all of the variables and uh, the different elements that go into the performance and then take that into Quite literally, the wild. There are so many other factors that you need to be able to uh, that really control and maintain in that process. Uh, but it does open up really that step just past what John had mentioned before, the uncanny valley, where there's a level of realism in a virtual environment that's just not realistic at all. You get to a point where the, uh, where the brain just doesn't accept it as real, no matter what. And if you can jump past that by adding a lot more uh, realistic factors, then people feel more comfortable with it. But boy, is it difficult because there are so many other uh, variables to control. Um, Luckily, uh, motion capture is getting to the point where you can 
do a lot of these things, you've been able to take motion capture outdoors for years. The, the real limitation is you need power, you need cabling, you need to be able to set these up. How do you hide potentially things like uh, cameras and computers and different things when you're in the forest or outdoor in an open field where you're going to put your cameras there? And really that's where we're seeing a lot of other sensor types coming in. Uh, Vicon just recently acquired a uh, uh, an IMU company called I measure you. Um, and so we've already been involved in a, a lot of different sensor types. Our cameras actually have accelerometry and temperature sensors and all of these different things, and we've had it for quite some time. So we see that this hybrid environment with the flexibility of going indoors and outdoors is uh, really the future. And it's something we've already been doing for a while, but if you really do want to unlock the potential of doing things in different environments, then, yeah, we're going to have to kind of uh, think outside the box. When you think about um, sort of other uses for mocap, um, you know, imagine that we're in the movie theater of the future, right, and uh, we've got a Vicon system up in the up in the ceiling, and we're tracking, you know, 200 heads that are all wearing, uh, you know, augmented reality headsets. So, you know, right now you might go to a theater and you put on some stereo glasses and you see some 3D, but in the future you might go and put on some kind of set and stuff actually comes out of the screen and runs up and down the walls and you know, dives behind the chairs. Uh, you know, this is the kinds of stuff that we're figuring out here at, at the Technicolor Experience Center. And, and, you know, for those kinds of things, you know, you need, you, need, you need to know where all these heads are. You need to know what their particular angle of view is on this, on this augmented element that jumps out of the screen so that you can draw it to look right from their perspective, which is, you know, something that the old stereoscopic movies haven't really ever done for us. That's an interesting point in that we have to, you know, collect the data um, using these advanced systems and then really deploy them in a way that um, is entertaining and, you know, thrilling to the to the end user. So, Jeff, this partnership between Technicolor and Vicon actually started around the creation of Alien in Utero. And I know there was a funny story on the day when you came to demo the system. So do you think you could walk us through your first experience uh, showcasing you guys' tech to Technicolor? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, uh, unbeknownst to us, it was essentially the litmus test for Vicon in a real-world environment uh, where we thought we were just demoing a system. So we show up uh, the day before and beautiful building. We were really excited to get everything going, and we just figured it's like any other demo. So we start setting up um, – these temporary tripods and we put up our cameras and we dial in the system like we would for any other demo. It's there's, there's always a saying in sales, of course, like throwing up air quotes, it's a demo environment. There are expectations that there might be failures here and there, but you're really supposed to try to put your best foot forward. So the next day we showed up and it was a full production environment. The director came in, talent, uh, all of these uh, additional technicians were there and we were kind of blown away. We thought this was just going to be a demo, no big deal. And so we're kind of crossing our fingers, sweating a little bit, hoping that everything works. And we're pretty confident in what Vicon can do in a dialed-in environment. So off we went, and everything ended up being flawless. We were able to capture uh, such a good performance that the, the real-time playback of everything was exactly what the director was looking for. He could change camera angles using everything virtually. He was able to really kind of say, oh, wow, so the system can do this. All right, let's try this. And then we went directly into a VR environment with a Vive, uh, and it was this fantastic example of the capabilities that you can see right off the bat uh, using a Vicon system at Technicolor, and, and we knew that there was a lot of magic there. So <laughs> it started off a little rocky because we thought it was just going to be a demo, but uh, uh, everything really worked out well. Well, from a demo environment to millions of views online, I would say it was a pretty successful first collaboration. And, you know, that brings me to an understanding of I would love to hear what the goal of Vicon's partnership with the Technicolor Experience Center is and, and what excites both of you about the potential for this collaboration? Well, you know, here, here at the tech, we're trying to be this like, you know, uh, I don't know, starship enterprise kind of environment where, you know, you come on here and you see all this amazing technology um, and, you know, we're heading out trying to explore this galaxy of possibilities. And, you know, when you come into our showroom here, it's like stocked with all this amazing stuff. 
and you know we're trying different combinations of stuff to see what works and what doesn't and how we can you know figure out what the you know what the future may hold and having a you know a hyper accurate motion capture system is really a big part of that and so you know when you walk into our showroom we're tracking all kinds of different things whether it's you know heads or bodies or cameras or objects and we do that here with Vicon because it's the most accurate system it's also the most scalable system meaning like you know if you had to scale it up to hundreds of cameras you know, you can do that with a Vicon system. If you have to use it to, you know, trigger doing something like a, the nomadic VR guys are doing where you had to, you know, uh, step on a plate and get it to trigger a fan that, uh, you know, like you've got all these weird little devices out there and they're location-based entertainment things. And, you know, Vicon is capable of powering all that stuff. So, you know, the idea here with the partnership is that if you come here and you get this glimpse of the future, uh, you'll see that it's powered by Vicon. That's exactly right. We saw the potential almost immediately. And I mean, when we, when we were talking with the tech early on, uh, we were, you know, like any other system, when, when we start the process of, uh, you know, the consultative design process for making a system for someone, we ask, you know, what are you guys looking for? What do you need? And it was kind of a, it was like a Rick and Morty episode where they said, show me what you've got. And we're like, okay, so we've got to show them everything that we've got. Um, so we really put our heads together and tried to express to them that we have the tools to get you 90% of the way, and that 10% is the infinite capacity of, of all of the virtual production uh, you know, directions that you want to go now. And we, we just saw immediately, uh, once we got there, like, yeah, okay, we're going to put our best, best foot forward and show them all the, the, the tools that we have and what we could do. We just saw immediately that they wanted to do everything in every possible capacity. I mean, John mentioned the movie theater full of 200 cameras. I mean, they want to be able to do that right away um, with whatever whatever they could fit inside their studio. Um, so we're just really excited that we essentially have a flagship partner that really recognizes the potential in us um, that we hope that every customer can see, but also extracts every tool. They always say, oh, you, you only use a small percentage of your brain for whatever your, your, life, your life tasks are. Well, I feel like Technicolor is ready to use 100% of all the brains. Um, so we're really, really excited. Well, John, that's, that's an exciting challenge for you. So do you think you could speak to uh, uh, what mocap services are currently available at the tech and then you know, how you're building out these capabilities on the stage to lay the groundwork for the future of immersive experiences and, you know, real-time multiplayer interactions and that sort of thing? Yeah, so, I mean, it is a fully functional virtual production stage, uh, which means that we're capable of capturing uh, full performance capture. Performance capture is, you know, motion capture plus face and fingers and uh, audio and, you know, all the surrounding components of an entire performance. Um, but we're not trying to shoot the next avatar here. We're trying to figure out how you would shoot the next avatar. The kind of stuff that we're shooting here currently from a sort of mocap point of view is very experimental stuff. So, you know, maybe like uh, if you look at the people that are trying to do like IK avatars into virtual reality headsets where, you know, you've got these points of information about the head and the hands and you see a lot of games out there that'll, you know, hang a little IK guy into that into those three points, it doesn't look that great. And so what kind of thing we're doing here would be maybe capture several thousand animations and then statistically fit that data set of animation into these points in a way that you're getting a real high fidelity performance, but out of these low points. So a lot of it is like what Jeff described earlier, which is collecting ground truth data, you know, understanding how humans move and how they work and, and how they move and how they work in, in virtual reality. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of neat experiments here right now where you can uh, extract motion straight from video. Um, what's another neat one we've got going on? There's, uh, you know, a, a lot of interesting computer vision stuff, machine learning and deep learning. You know, Technicolor, uh, they, they're, they're a much bigger company than I ever realized. With You know, they own NPC and the mill and all these different uh, uh, connected home devices, like set-top boxes, like cable boxes, and that kind of stuff. So there's, you know, all this amazing technology within the, what is it, several thousand people who work here. And, you know, here's a place where this, like, laboratory environment where they can come and, and collect data that they need to use in their experiments. 
And Jeff, I'd love to hear how Vicon is approaching the, the new emerging needs of these real-time um, systems, you know, for people interacting in VR with, with motion capture enabling, you know, really rich, high-fidelity interactions. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you just actually mentioned a, a capability that hasn't been quite there for so long. So it's uh, it's not that we're looking to expand on it. We're looking to make it real. Uh, one of the biggest issues is that, yeah, you can have a motion capture performance and record it in the background and then post-process it, and then uh, six months, a year later, you have something that you can then show people, and then they can work with canned data. But uh, like John was mentioning, things are getting to the point where you need accepted perceivability of something happening in real time to be able to create a true immersive uh, you know, virtual experience. So... Vicon Shogun is the new software platform where we're pushing things to the point where you do not have to worry about uh, the the blips and the, oh, the 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 crazy things that happen with mocap where you move a certain way and all of a sudden an arm flips or it looks like you're you've jumped 12 feet but then you jump back the things that real time performances for a motion capture systems couldn't really handle effectively. For a long time, Shogun, Blade as its predecessor did, but Shogun really handles that to where you can have six people all being captured simultaneously live in an environment and not have to worry about any of the data breaking. It's going to look real. You can have people in a, you know, uh, in a rugby scrum or really close together or rolling around on the ground or in a live military environment, and you don't have to worry about the body data being an issue, which means that you could put somebody into that environment virtually, and now you can have models being driven by real performances live. So if somebody wants to say, if somebody wants to do the most engaging virtual reality experience that involves humans interacting with somebody in VR, well, you can have real people there on the scene, and everybody has, that's actually looking at it from their VR headset won't ever fall into that uncanny valley where, oh, hold on a second, it kind of looked real until his arm flew off. Well, that's not going to be a problem anymore because we've really kind of pushed the edge to where all of these performances are being captured perfectly and it feels real. That's actually an exciting use case for me, too. I love the idea of taking a real actor uh, or, you know, maybe it's an instructor, a teacher, um, but, you know, motion capturing them and injecting them into a virtual reality in real time. So, you know, maybe I'm a classroom full of kids halfway across the world and we can take an MIT professor in a mocap suit and, you know, have him teach a classroom. Like it's, uh, you know, there, there's so many cool possibilities when you can enable real time presence like this. Thank you both so much for the time. It was truly enlightening. And as you can tell, I think our head is just spinning with the, the creative possibilities and the wide-ranging applications of what these technologies enable. So I uh, really appreciate the discussion and, and look forward to seeing where it goes in the future. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thanks a lot, John. Thanks, Brian.